Hi guys, and welcome back to Logical Redstone Reloaded. Last episode, we covered a bunch of combinational logic devices. Today, we're gonna talk about some smaller circuits that I think you'll find really useful. I hope you enjoy. So far in this series, whenever I showed a circuit, I've only cared about what the values of the input and output are. I never really focused on the length or timing of redstone pulses. But today, that changes. Let's get more comfortable with redstone pulses and how to use them. Remember from episode 1 that Minecraft runs on a tick system, and there are 10 redstone ticks per second. Therefore, each tick is a tenth of a second, which we can use as a unit of time. For example, a stone button stays on for exactly one second, but you could also say that it stays on for 10 ticks. Because of this, a stone button is essentially a 10 tick pulse generator. Any redstone connected to a stone button will receive a 10 tick pulse when the button is pressed. And a wooden button is a 15 tick pulse generator, activating redstone around it for one and a half seconds. Now, if you want to generate a shorter pulse, my favorite way to do it is with a comparator. For example, this is a 2 tick pulse generator. When I press this button, the comparator receives a signal, but 2 ticks later, it gets cancelled, giving us a nice 2 tick pulse. The delay between the initial signal and the cancellation is the length of the pulse that gets generated. If I make the delay 4 ticks instead, it becomes a 4 tick pulse generator. And by the way, a little trick to prove to yourself that this is indeed a 4 tick pulse is to put it into a line of repeaters and freeze the game. As you can see, the pulse is exactly 4 repeaters long. Or if you don't have carpet mod, you can also lock the repeaters. The one downside to this design is that you can't use it to generate a 1 tick pulse. It simply won't give an output. The reason gets pretty technical, but it's basically because of how comparators update themselves. In my opinion though, you shouldn't be using 1 tick pulses anyways because they tend to cause issues. But if you absolutely need a 1 tick pulse, the easiest way to do it is with observers. Observers output a 1 tick pulse whenever they receive a block update in the back. But anyways, whenever I make pulse generators, this comparator setup is my go-to. Of course, there are still many different designs as well, especially using observers, pistons, and droppers. And I'll leave those in the world download if you're interested. Now, keep in mind that this strategy will only allow you to generate a pulse shorter than the button pulse, because that's kind of what these circuits are doing. They're shortening the pulse from a button. If you want to generate a pulse longer than the button, you need to lengthen it instead of shortening it. For example, let's take this 10 tick button pulse and extend it to last for 3 more ticks. I'll put another dust here, a 3 tick repeater, and a block so that the signal powers the main line. And now, when I press this button, we get a 13 tick pulse. A great way to visualize what's happening here is with a diagram. The original button pulse lasts for 10 ticks, so if each block represents 1 tick of time, then that's 10 blocks of wool. Now, because of this repeater, we're essentially generating another 10 tick pulse 3 ticks later, which looks like this on the diagram. And if you OR these together, you'll notice that we're getting a consistent signal from at least one of them for the first 13 ticks. So that's why this circuit works as a 13 tick pulse generator. While we're on the subject of pulse extension, there's an interesting property of repeaters that I should probably mention in this video. If a repeater receives a pulse shorter than its delay length, it will extend it up to that length. For example, here I have a 2 tick pulse generator immediately going into a 3 tick repeater. You would expect the 2 tick pulse to just go through the repeater and come out 3 ticks later, but that's not exactly what happens. Yes, it does come out 3 ticks later, but it also gets extended to a 3 tick pulse. This extension will happen anytime a repeater receives a pulse that is shorter than its delay setting. We saw it happen here because 2 is less than 3. As another quick example, if you give a 1 tick pulse to a 4 tick repeater, it'll output a 4 tick pulse because 1 is less than 4. Next, let's talk about clocks. A clock is just a circuit that outputs a signal on a regular basis. The easiest way to make a clock is to just create a redstone loop and put a pulse inside of it. For example, this clock outputs a signal every 5 ticks. The loop is 5 ticks long, so every time the pulse completes a cycle, another 5 ticks have passed. And by changing how many ticks are in the loop, you can change how long the clock cycle is. Also, when clocks are brought up in discussions, you'll often hear the terms period and frequency. The period is just the length of the clock cycle, the time from one output to the next. So this clock has a 5 tick period, or 0.5 seconds. And the frequency is how frequent those cycles are with respect to time. Since every cycle takes half a second, there are 2 cycles per second. Therefore, the frequency is 2 hertz. Hertz literally means cycles per second. Additionally, period and frequency have an inverse relationship. If you take 1 divided by the period, you get the frequency. Or if you take 1 divided by the frequency, you get the period. 
Now, this type of clock is great, but it can be kind of annoying to start it and stop it. To start it, you have to hook up a pulse generator to it, and to stop it, you have to somehow kill the pulse, perhaps by canceling a comparator or by using a piston to break the loop. But there's another design for a clock that is much easier to start and stop. And it looks like this. Simply take a comparator on subtract mode and route it back into its own side. When you power the comparator from the back, the clock starts. And if you stop powering it, the clock stops. Unlike the previous design, this new type of clock produces a perfect alternating signal. For example, this clock's loop has a total of five ticks, one for the comparator plus four for the repeater. So the signal coming out of it is alternating every five ticks. Five ticks on, five ticks off. Five ticks on, five ticks off. And this means that the period of this clock is actually 10 ticks because it's producing a five tick pulse every 10 ticks. All right, as a final challenge, just to kind of sum everything up, Let's create a clock that has, I don't know, a 16 tick period and outputs a three tick pulse. I'll start with a comparator and add seven more ticks to the loop before canceling it. So this clock will give an eight tick pulse every 16 ticks. To make it a three tick pulse instead, we can just add another comparator, which gets canceled three ticks later. And there we go. This is exactly what we want. A clock with a 16 tick period that outputs a three tick pulse. And best of all, we can easily turn it on and off with this lever in the back. Beautiful. All right, for the rest of this video, let's talk about latches and flip-flops. Latches and flip-flops are basically small, useful circuits that use memory to their advantage. But how can a circuit have memory? What does that even mean? Well, take a look at this circuit. We have an OR gate with the output looping back to one of the inputs. If I power the input, then it will stay on forever, even if I stop powering it. In a way, this lamp being on is the circuit remembering what I did. The problem is, it can't forget it. There's no way to switch this back to zero unless I manually break the circuit. So consider this circuit instead. This time we have two torches in a chain with the output of the second one looping back into the first one. If we force the first torch to be off, then the second torch turns on, giving us a permanent output. And if we force the second torch to be off, then the first torch turns on, and it switches back to how it was before with the lamp permanently off. This is called a set reset latch or an SR latch because you can set the lamp to be on or you can reset it to be off. Now, me personally, I find SR latches easiest to think about if you view them as two knot gates with someone hijacking the signal. But technically, that's not how it works. These torches are actually NOR gates. In fact, if you make a big SR latch like this, it's much easier to see why it's made with two NORs. The set signal and the output are clearly NORed and put into a second NOR with the reset signal. And as you can see, it's the same circuit. I can set it and I can reset it. One cool thing about SR latches is that you can get the inverse of the output for free. Notice that the first NOR always outputs the opposite of the second one. So if you just route that to the front as well, you now have the regular output and the inverted output. This wiring is kind of weird though, so another way to do it is to put the NOR gates side by side and have the outputs crisscross each other on the way back. This makes it way easier to get the regular output and the inverted output. And if you search SR latch on Google Images, you'll notice that this is the most common layout for it. It's the design that you'll see many times if you take a class on Digital Logic. But in Minecraft, you don't have to use this giant circuit for an SR latch. There are actually some much smaller designs. For example, here's my favorite design for an SR latch. It's absolutely tiny. Here's your set, here's your reset, here's your regular output, and here's your inverted output. The last thing I want to mention about SR latches is that it can be useful to enable them or disable them. You can do this by putting two comparators in the front with a torch. This lever is called the enable signal. When the enable signal is 1, the latch is enabled, so you can set it or reset it just like normal. But when the enable signal is off, the latch is disabled, so you can't mess with it. Very nice. Alright, so SR latches are great, and I use them all the time. But an interesting question is, what happens if you try to set it and reset it at the same time? Well, this is where it gets weird. If you set and reset at the same time, then the output and the inverted output are both one which makes no sense. 
Something and its inversion should never be the same thing. So this next type of latch called a data latch or D latch is kind of an attempt to solve that problem. A data latch uses an SR latch as a base and then it has one input called the data. The data is plugged directly into set and the inverted version is plugged into reset. The motivation behind this is that when you're using an SR latch, you tend to either be setting and not resetting or resetting and not setting, which is exactly what this setup forces you to do. So this is a data latch. When the data is one, the output is one. And when the data is zero, the output is zero. But that's not very useful, right? I mean, what's the point of having a circuit where the output is just the input? Well, honestly, there isn't one. However, it starts to get interesting when you add an enable signal to a D-latch. If you disable a D-latch, then the output is whatever the data was at the time of disabling it. So this allows us to capture data at a specific time. Think of it this way. When the latch is enabled, it's simply listening to the data and repeating what it hears. But when it gets disabled, it captures the current data in place, and now it's not listening anymore. And this idea of capturing data is so useful that Mojang gave us a way to do it really, really easily. It's a repeater lock. A repeater lock is literally a D latch. When it's unlocked, it simply repeats the data and locking it captures the data. So yeah, if you find yourself needing a D latch, you don't need to use this big setup. You can just use a repeater lock. And that's it for latches. SR and data are the two main types of latches in digital logic. Finally, let's talk about flip-flops. Flip-flops are extremely similar to latches. As far as I can tell from my research, the main difference is how the enable signal gets used. A latch can be enabled or disabled at will, which means that latches are either constantly responding to the inputs or never responding to the inputs. On the other hand, a flip-flop is meant to be used with a clock. By hooking up a clock to the enable signal, a flip-flop updates itself every clock cycle. And as it turns out, the SR latch and the D latch have a corresponding SR flip-flop and D flip-flop. But they're literally the exact same circuit. The only difference is that the enable signal is hooked up to a clock. I mean, this is the D flip-flop. It's literally just a repeater lock like we had before, but this time it gets quickly unlocked after every clock cycle. This means that on every clock cycle, it gets updated with whatever the current data is. The other flip-flop I want to show you is the toggle flip-flop, or T flip-flop. Every clock cycle, if the input is 1, it toggles. Otherwise, it does nothing. This design uses an SR as a base, but there's actually a much better design for a T flip-flop. This is a tiny T flip-flop using, once again, a repeater lock. When I press this button, the output toggles between on and off. I don't know enough about the game's code to understand how this one actually works, but feel free to explain it in the comments if you know. Now, technically this design isn't exactly a T flip-flop, it's more like a T flip-flop where the main input is always one and you are the clock signal when you press this button. But whatever, it's close enough. Ultimately what makes it useful is its ability to toggle. And there are many other designs for a T flip-flop as well, which I've included in the world download. For example, here's a tiny one using an observer and a piston. Now you might be wondering, what about a T-latch? Is that a thing? Well, even though latches and flip-flops are very similar, I would argue that a T-latch is not a thing. I say that because if you force a T-flip-flop to be constantly enabled instead of using a short clock pulse, it just keeps toggling forever. And that is definitely not something a latch should do. So yeah, I don't think a T-latch makes a lot of sense, but Everything else here is pretty well defined. Next episode, we'll be using these latches to create registers, counters, and other exciting circuits. If you enjoy these videos, subscribe and check out my Patreon page in the description. I also have a Redstone Discord server, so come join us if that sounds interesting. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed. Peace out, guys.